Oh yeah, you read that title right. Today we are going to be looking at the Muse Iceberg and explaining each level. So if you're new to this concept, basically what happens is you go from top to bottom. At the top of the iceberg, you have things that are most likely to be known by casual fans or even people who just heard of the band. And at the bottom are things that you'd have to be a super fan to really know what the reference is. And this is going to be explaining every single tier of the iceberg from one to seven, I believe it is. Now, this is one I just found on Reddit. It was by snoo-37059. So thank you, Mr. Snoo, if you're the creator, great job. I just noticed nobody had done one of these on YouTube. So uh, considering the fact that this is my favorite band of all time, I figured it'd be time for someone to cover it. So first of all, Muse is a three-piece band. They're from Sydney in the United Kingdom. And they actually started a good amount of time before their first album was released, but let's get into that soon. So this is the tier above the iceberg, also known as level one. And the first thing on here is Showbiz. Now Showbiz is the first studio album from the band. This was released in 1999. It actually did really well in the charts, reaching number nine in the UK albums chart. Now, of course, this didn't have crossover appeal to the States as much as some of their later works did. It actually also is the title track of the album, which still is a fan favorite to this day. Now for Hysteria's baseline, this has been voted the best baseline ever in some polls. The baseline actually originated from the song Futurism, which is a Japanese bonus track on the album Origin of Symmetry, which is another one on this level. This is their second studio album released in 2001 and is generally considered the fan favorite. Knights of Cydonia, on the other hand, is the closing track off of their fourth studio album, Black Holes and Revelations. And it is typically the closing song at most of their live set lists as well, and this is probably because of the hardcore and casual fan crossover appeal. I actually did a poll on this channel ranking all of the Muse songs. And if you want to check out that, I'll link it. But it ranked number one out of all of them, I believe. So if you're interested in checking that out, here's the link. So like I said, it has a crossover appeal with hardcore and more casual fans. And the progressive structure of the song lends itself to this big buildup and payoff for everyone to party along with at the end. It's very big and epic. If you've ever been to a Muse show, you know. It has a very strange yet awesome fusion of Western, space rock, and mariachi-like sounds. Interestingly, the lead guitar tone at the introduction of the song was inspired by the hit Telstar, from the Tornadoes, which features Matt Bellamy's father as the rhythm guitarist. The band has described the song as 40 years of rock history in six minutes, and it was actually a pretty big hit over in America because it was brought into, I believe, one of the Guitar Hero games. So even my friends who aren't very Big fans of Muse know and love this song. And finally, on this tier, we have Uprising, which is probably their biggest hit. The only contest would be Madness, which is an extremely huge hit over in America, being, I believe it's the second longest number one alternative rock song ever in America, which is pretty shocking. But Uprising features a more like Doctor Who type of thromping bass line and spacey synths. It is a very classic like Muse song and is very popular. So you probably already know that song. So let's get down to level two. Muse probably garnered most of their attention across the globe during the popularity of the Twilight movies and books. The author of Twilight, uh, Stephanie Meyer, I believe is her name. She actually requested for Muse to be featured on the soundtrack as they were her favorite band at the time. So the famous baseball scene from the first movie, which is very funny and campy, has Supermassive Black Hole, one of my favorite songs ever, playing in the background. And they actually wrote an entire song, Neutron Star Collision, for one of the later movies in the series. Simulation Theory was the second most recent album released by Muse, just before Will of the People. It featured a much more synth-focused approach and more of a synth-pop in some ways approach. Though I would say it received mixed reviews from critics and fans alike, as it felt a little bit safer than their more ambitious previous adventures. Hullabaloo's soundtrack, as it's known, or just Hullabaloo, is basically a compilation and live album from Muse. It essentially functions as a two-parter where the first part is all of these new songs or edited songs of previous works. For example, Hyperchondriac Music is a slow version of Hyper Music, which is a song on Origin of Symmetry previously mentioned. And it basically functions as a full studio album. The only difference being that there is a live album attached on the second half of it. There's some amazing tracks in here, such as Recess, Shrinking Universe, Yes Please. They're very heavy and dark, more extreme in the direction of Origin of Symmetry 
very far removed from where the band would go in the future. Feeling Good is a cover of a song made famous by Nina Simone and was voted the best cover version of the song by NME. It features a really good fusion of the typical jazzy elements of the originals, but twists in the Muse gritty heaviness that I really love and the bombast. <laughs> As for Radiohead comparisons, this is something that really only applies in my mind to the first album. Only their first album holds true hints of the Radiohead-isms that everyone knows. After that, once you get to Origin of Symmetry, the massive bombastic space rock influences take way higher precedence over any Radiohead influences, and I think the only reason anybody compares the two is because Matt's voice is very similar to Tom York's in the softer, older songs. If you hear him today, he actually sounds very different than Tom. His delivery has gotten much deeper and more dramatic over the years. When you fall down. Back in the day, Matt used to get bothered by the comparisons and would seemingly be annoyed when asked multiple times in a row, calling it lazy journalism at one point. He actually claims that they were really not influenced much by the band, citing artists like Jeff Buckley as bigger inspirations. Bellamy has called Radiohead's The Benz one of the two most important albums of the 90s though. And on the other hand, Dom Howard, the drummer, basically said, uh, Radiohead was one of our major influences when they were younger. And now we're at level three. First off is Lazenith, which is where the Hullabaloo soundtrack live parts were recorded. This is one of the most beloved shows from Muse fans as it features very energetic, frantic, fun, over the top, crazy performances that really embrace the old aspects of Muse that people tend to love. It's actually mixed fairly well, although there is a little bit of muddiness in the mix but the energy here is just 11 out of 10. Now, so Lazenith was the live version for like the Origin of Symmetry and Hullabaloo Days, while Harp is the live version for the Absolution slash Black Holes and Revelations Days, which are the two following albums. And Harp is one of the most crisply mixed live versions I've ever heard. Pretty much every song from front to back sounds amazing. And it was from the absolutely sold out Wembley Stadium multi-day performances. As for what genres are Muse, I looked up what genres Muse on Google and I got dance slash electronics. So I understand the confusion. I suppose what's being looked at here is the fact that on nearly every album, Muse tends to reinvent their sound in some way, which makes them pretty hard to categorize in terms of genre. Exogenesis is a three-part symphony at the end of the Resistance album, and it is essentially a nine or 10 minute long epic full of strings, piano, electric guitars, and bombast. It's split into the three parts, first being Overture, second Cross-Pollination, and three Redemption, each featuring a very distinct sound. The first sounding more spacey and ominous, the second sounding dark and epic, and the third sounding hopeful and reflective. Matt destroying guitars. So in this case, Matt has the record for the most guitar smashed on a tour, which I believe was 140, although the secret was that he didn't actually smash them. Matt was able to salvage the guitar in most of these cases, only damaging the neck. So the actual core of the guitar was preserved while the neck might have been smashed to pieces. Olympics 2012. Muse was the headlining band and also wrote a song to be essentially the theme song for the 2012 Olympics. Now the song here was Survival. It's an absolutely big, anthemic, grand, metal, symphonic, over-the-top dramatic piece that is supposed to inspire, inspire people to win. Literally, that's what it says. And lastly, Muse, the making of it. So you can find these on YouTube. It is essentially behind the scenes footage of Muse creating their albums. And it is amazing to watch, shows a lot of insight into the band's process. They're typically very fun. And as they're on YouTube, I totally just recommend them. But uh, after you watch this video, because my video is the best. Now to level four. So first off we have Beldam, which is I guess the ship name of uh, fans, which um, I'm not a fan of ship shipping stuff, so I'm uh, gonna probably skip over that, but there's some stuff there. Blockades Live. So Blockades was one of the fan favorite songs off of Simulation Theory. It featured kind of the older style, thromping sounds, similar cadence and rhythm to something like Knights of Cydonia, while featuring a chorus that matched the energy of things on Absolution. 
So this was fusing some of their older work with their newer work and people tended to really like it. And then it was never played live, which was very shocking for fans as it has a lot of energy and seems like it lends itself well to the live setting. Rocket Baby Dolls was Muse's name before their name was Muse, and you could listen to their name without laughing. So this was the name that was used in their first ever gig, which is essentially a battle of the bands. Bellamy described their original sound of Rocket Baby Dolls as experimental and noise, and despite their inability to play music, they won the competition. Dom's Fashion. Now this is one that I don't have a particular answer at. This comes from around the era of the harp live show, I believe. Matt asks why Dom always wears these super tight pants, and Dom jokes that they were too tight to take off. Matt comments, they're a bit gay, aren't they? And then Dom replied, easy. So that's what I found on Dom's fashion. Do with that what you will. Matt's speech impediment. Now, I'm not sure of the depths of this, but I know that Matt has described it as a speech impediment, and this includes his, like, mixing of the letter R and W, where a lot of times you'll hear fans joking about him saying, whopper which will come up later on the list as well. You also hear him on stage rushing through his dialogue. He becomes a very jumbled mess at times and you can't really understand exactly what he's saying. And I think this has to do partially with his confusing of those syllables. As for The Muse, this is one of the things I couldn't find. I'm assuming it has to do with something where the band was announced as The Muse instead of Muse. But uh, how about you guys let me know down below what you can find for that one. And the last one in this section would be Matt Aging. And the point of this one is that he kind of reverse ages. If you look up concerts of him from 1999, he legitimately looks older than he does in some of the concerts from times like 2019. So I guess the joke is that uh, he doesn't age and he kind of goes in the opposite direction. Let us know your uh, face care routine, Matt, please. I'm begging you. Now to level five, the supermassive black hole lyrics. So these are very suggestive lyrics when you read them in a certain way. Um, I think the whole point of this part of the iceberg is to just say that the lyrics are about uh let's just say women and their um hold that they can get on you like a black hole and suck you in yep that's that's what i got on the other side we have the follow me lyrics and these are much more wholesome and i can talk about them they are about his son typically you would think that this would be a love song but it's actually about his son and the beginning of the track actually features his son's heartbeat which is a very nice touch Propaganda, this is a song off of simulation theory. There's a few details about this. He says he wants to suck out your soul like a Death Eater, which is a gaff because it's the Dementors who do that. And they didn't realize that until after the song was already done, so unlucky, I guess. But also going back to the speech impediment issue, some people say that he intentionally put propaganda there a bunch to make fun of the speech impediment thing. As you see in here, we also have Plopper. So he wanted to put pwa 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 in there for the lols, allegedly. Next we have Sit the F Down, which is a hilarious clip of Dom, I believe it's Dom, in the mask of Corey Taylor from Slipknot yelling and goofing off in a way imitating, uh, I don't know if I'd say mocking because I think they actually appreciate Slipknot at this point in their careers. I personally love Slipknot, just saw them live. They're bangers, you guys should all see them. But it's a really funny clip. What did I fucking say? Then we have Adagio for strings. Now this ties back to the Hysteria bassline from before. Now before Hysteria starts, 
we get a song called Interlude, which is basically Matt and Chris, Chris being the bass player, Matt being the guitar player, playing this ambient kind of, almost sounds like a classical thing, and it's actually inspired from Adagio for strings, which sounds very similar if you hear it. It's very legato, stretched out sounds, and it leads nicely into the bass line of Hysteria to kick off the song. And they actually play it live most of the time too. And finally, we have New Kind of Kick, which was the first new Muse song that I was there for as a super hardcore fan. And I was really disappointed because it's more of a um, joke song, I guess. I think it's a cover, actually. Uh, and they did it for Halloween as kind of a goof off song. It sounds pretty nice, but you can definitely tell it's not like a full on new Muse track for a new album, kicking off a new era. It features a very goofy video with butt shaking and goofing and gaffing and sillying. Next to level six, we have Matt trying to kill Dom. So this one's interesting. Going back to how Matt likes to destroy his guitars, he uh, doesn't really seem to care too much where he throws these guitars and sometimes they can land on Dom, unfortunately. And I believe one time Dom had to get multiple stitches over it. And there's been more than a couple occasions where Dom has had to absolutely duck out of the way from a flying guitar. Just, Matt, chill the hell out. What are you doing, man? The enemies. Muse has a very interesting relationship with the enemies where one year they might be voted the best live band and the next they'll be nominated for the worst band in the world. And uh, there's a very funny interview and sequence of interviews, I guess, of Matt and Dom quite drunk at the enemies. Talking about just this, maybe I'll play a little clip here. Here we are backstage at the Enemy Awards. It's Muse there for the second year running the best British band. How are you feeling, gentlemen? Great. Over the moon. Second year running. That's pretty cool. It, I feel like having a deja vu Fuck right now. You <laughs> yeah, you. <laughs> Fuck you. Uh, but yeah, it feels great. It feels really cool. Uh, so, no, no, no. Enemy is like, uh, I love Enemy. I love it because it's, it's like it's like that crazy, weird, crazy sort of codependent psycho girlfriend that like loves you one minute, then hates you, then loves you, then hates you, and it just makes you want to come back for more. I want more from the Enemy. That's what I want. I believe in the Enemy. I love the Enemy. Always have done. Soldier's Poem and Absolution is here because of a famous interview where Matt insists that Soldier's Poem was on Absolution. I, I could be wrong on this, but I think the reason he insisted so harshly on that is because they may have written Soldier's Poem during Absolution, but it's definitely not on Absolution. Like, uh, that, that track, or well, maybe Soldier's oh, Poem, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Soldier's yeah. Poem on um, Black Holes and Revelations. Yeah. And that was like a really kind of stripped down. No, that was on Absolution. <laughs> Soldier's Poem. Yeah, yeah. Wasn't it? Uh, Black Holes no, and Revelation. Okay, right. Singing along to microcuts. So Microcuts is a song off of their second studio album, Origin of Symmetry, and this song will make you sound like a dying goat if you try to sing it because it is very high and extremely heavy and you just, you can't sing it unless you're Matt probably. Maybe just don't try, but everyone tries. Okay, I'm not gonna try to stop you because I know it's gonna happen. And finally, we have level seven. First off here, Brie is a gay cheese, which interestingly enough features our buddy Zane Lowe, who has since mellowed out quite a bit. But if you watch him and Muse back in the old days, you can see they're a lot more rambunctious, okay? Uh, Muse hanging out with us for the entire show in a desperate attempt to boost ratings. Uh, and, this is, uh, this and he asked a question of Muse of what's their favorite cheese. I believe Matt says his is cheddar. And then Dom says Brie. And then, uh, yeah, uh, I mean, you'll see the clip. Brie, that's a gay cheese. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it? No, seriously. I mean, all honesty. It's quality French cheese. Next is Fishing Trip. Now, this is a video that you can just find on YouTube again. I'll play a clip probably here, but you can just find the clip here on YouTube. I don't know what this was filmed for. Maybe it was for the behind the scenes of something, but... <laughs> It's uh, it's the boys on a fishing trip, and they're just learning how to fish, and it's uh, it's pretty funny actually. I'm a proper fish. Look, I've got a proper fish on. That's got a bit of weight to look. That noise you made, Dom. That noise you made. That noise again. 
Look at that noise he made. <laughs> oh. I'll tell you what, yeah? That's inspired me. That's a proper fish. That's nearly a proper fish. Completely different fish. <laughs> You've done it. It's been caught about 10 times today already. Jesus. That's a uh, nice fish. Uh, let's keep it, let's eat it. Yes. <laughs> that's, that's, that's just eatable, Dom. That is eatable. What is that? Nice, nicely hooked. <laughs> <laughs> Matt's socks is here because of uh, back in the day there was a Muse forum like the official Muse forums like 2001 so early days of the internet and once in a while Matt would post on the Muse forums and sometimes these conversations would get a little bit weird Matt would talk about how he uh, he enjoys when women wear socks yes and finally, we have Tom Kirk, who is basically a de facto fourth member of the band, who's been closely involved with pretty much everything the band has done. You can see him tweeting about behind the scenes stuff and being pretty closely involved with just about everything the band does. So, okay, that was my first time ever doing one of these. Let me know how I did. I hope you guys liked the video. Maybe you learned something new. I didn't go too deep on some of these. There's a little more I could have gone into, but uh, wanted to keep it a reasonable length. So uh, yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed it. Yep. That's all I got. Okay, bye.